Hi there. Uh, I am J.K. Remus. Thank you very much for joining me, uh, for joining us. I am so excited to uh, have you join us for uh, this second in our uh, series of um, talks on new ideas in critical disaster studies and climate change, uh, or, or perhaps it is uh, new ideas in climate change and critical disaster studies. I never remember which order it goes in. Uh, this is an uh, this is the inaugural series of events hosted by the Initiative for Critical Disaster Studies, uh, of which I am the director. Uh, the Initiative for Critical Disaster Studies is a new project uh, at NYU Gallatin, which is trying to encourage the critical study of disaster at NYU and, and beyond. Uh, it starts with the idea that disaster itself is a constructed category that presents some suffering as normal and acceptable, others as not normal, not acceptable, and that that construction is, in, in particular, is classed, raced, and gendered. Um, people with less power um, who are in harm's way um, are put in harm's way by this, by this category and are made vulnerable to hazards uh, by, by the way that we construct uh, both the idea of disaster and also our response to disaster. Uh, and so as part of this project, we have been inviting people in to, to talk about some ideas in uh, climate change and, and disaster studies, but particularly we've been bringing people in from outside the academy, from um, uh, organizers and activists. So last month we had John Cartwright, who is a, uh, a labor leader in Canada, uh, kind of fighting for a just transition from carbon. Uh, today we have uh, Jacqueline Patterson from the NAAC NAACP, which I, uh, who I will introduce in just a moment. And I just want to plug uh, next month on uh, April 16th, uh, we have our one academic speaker in this uh, in this series, uh, Richard Mizell, uh, a uh, historian at the University of Houston, uh, who has written about Katrina and also the 1927 uh, Great Mississippi River flood. Uh, I'm really excited to have him uh, come and speak to us. So I hope that you will join us uh, this same um, time, any place you want on April 16th, uh, you can go to the Gallatin events page, gallatin.nyu.edu slash events to RSVP for Rick Mizell's talk. Uh, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, with that, I want to introduce uh, Jacqueline Patterson. Uh, I am so glad that she can join us. Uh, Jacqueline Patterson is the Senior Director of the NAACP Environmental and Climate Justice Program. Since 2007, she has also been the coordinator and co-founder of the Women of Color United. Uh, Jackie Patterson has worked as a researcher, a program manager, coordinator, advocate, and activist working on women's rights, violence against women, HIV AIDS, racial justice, economic justice, and environmental and climate justice. She, sure, she served as senior women's rights policy analyst for Action Aid, where she integrated a women's rights lens for the issues of food rights, macroeconomics, and climate change, as well as at the intersection of violence against women and HIV and AIDS. Uh, previously, she has also served as assistant vice president of HIV AIDS programs for IMA World Health, providing management and technical assistance to medical facilities and programs in 23 countries in Africa and the Caribbean. Uh, Patterson also served as the outreach project associate for the Center for Budget and Pro Policy Priorities, research coordinator at Johns Hopkins, uh, and she, pre before that, was a Peace Corps volunteer in Jamaica. Uh, Jackie Patterson holds master's degrees in social work uh, from the University of Maryland and, Mass and also in public health from Hopkins. She currently serves on the steering committee for interfaith moral action on climate, the advisory board uh, for the Center for Earth Ethics, as well as on the boards of directors for the Institute of, uh, of the Black World, the Hive Gender and Climate Justice Fund, the American Society for Adaptation Professionals, Greenpeace, Bill, the Bill Anderson Fund, People's Solar and Energy Fund, and the National Black Workers Center Project. So I'm so uh, pleased and happy to have Jacqueline Patterson come and speak to us. Uh, Jackie. Thank you so much. Uh, appreciate you all for having me. Thank you so much for 
uh, be interested in having you speak, Jacob, and looking forward to speaking with you all. So yeah, I will show some slides. I, um, I'll just start by saying that in this, uh, in this presentation, I will be giving a bit of an overview of, of how we experience this work as the NAACP around disasters, and particularly in the context of climate injustice and really what has led us to having this prol proliferation of disasters and how how the response to the disasters reflects the same systemic inequities that are driving us to where we are in terms of this uh, increasing uh, catastrophic climate change. So one of the things that we, as we do our work as the NAACP and in the climate justice movement, we all, um, on the climate justice side of the climate response, we have uh, principles of democratic organizing called the Jimenez principles. And one of the top principles, there's about, there's six Jimenez principles and the critical one is letting people speak for themselves. So to the greatest extent possible, I'd like to be able to, to use video where, so during the, the presentation, I would be talking a little bit about what's happening in communities, but we also would, would, would love to have communities who are able to speak for themselves. And so video kind of provides the, the forum for that to happen. So I'll be showing a, a couple of videos during this conversation. So I'm starting with this one. Um, it's just a trailer, actually, just a two minute trailer for a longer film that I recommend that folks check out called Trouble the Water. And it was made by these two basically just amateur folks who had their phones. Um, and I think they actually had a little bit of a, a, a a handheld cam that they, they shot this video. So, but, um, my name is Scott Michael yes, Roberts. Sorry. This is my wife, Kimberly Roberts. We're from New Orleans, the night war, sorry. underwater. Yeah. It's the sky, it looks pretty nice. It sure soon will change. Yeah, I'll hear some thunder. So Trouble the Waters, um, we actually just recently did a, a screening of the film and had the, the, um, the, the couple that made the film on the um, as speakers. So I think we have the video, we will soon have the video up on our, um, uh, uh, the video of the webinar up on our website. So we invite folks to check that out. But so, so from the, with that as a backdrop, um, we, we recognize how we've gotten to where we, we, we are now and where we continue to be. And so we always want to, to, to talk about the, the systemic and historic roots 
because they're not just historic. They, they really translate to what's happening now. We have this notion of this nation being founded on principles of liberty and religious freedoms. And, and so certainly that has, is, is an element of why people left Europe when they came, came here, but there's also the reality of what the practices were that were used and the notion, the false narrative of scarcity where I can only be well if I'm oppressing someone else. And so therefore the other principles and practices on which this, this nation were founded were of um, extraction, of um, exploitation, domination, and then acts of theft and, and murder um, of the original inhabitants of this nation. And then th taking that and going further to go over to to go over to um, the sub-Saharan Africa and extract um, people from their land, from their families, from what would have been their generational wealth, to put folks in the holes of ships to be commoditized and brought over to be someone else's generational wealth. And so, this is really the historical context that we have to understand in order to see what has been institutionalized in our trade, manufacturing, finance, labor policies, our housing policies, and what has resulted in the, 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 the disproportionate vulnerability that certain communities have to the impacts of disaster and how this whole system of, the, again, reckless extraction has led us to where we are in terms of being on this path to catastrophic climate change. And so in order to deal with it, we, we can't just deal with what's happening in the disaster continuum in a very literal sense, but we have to recognize that the continuum is within a larger construct of, of racism, of, of the, the economic and other exploitation of the earth and of its inhabitants. And, and we have to really dig out the roots in order to truly um, have liberty and justice for all. So, the NAACP, the Environmental and Climate Justice Program, um, has this, these three strategic objectives, but within a larger framework. Our, our largest mission statement as the, as the program is to advance the leadership of frontline communities to eliminate environmental and climate injustices and to ignite an environmental, social, and economic re revolution. And our kind of strategic objectives are around, you know, basically uh, eradicating pollution advancing energy efficiency and clean energy, recognizing that kind of the engine that runs the, the, um, the nation uh, and how we've done that historically is flawed and we need to actually transform that system to a totally different way of, of powering the nation. And then strengthening community resilience and the fact that climate change is already happening and already impacting communities. And so this is where a lot of our disaster work in terms of response and recovery lies but the, 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 um, the dealing with the uh, origins of it lie in this larger frame of our, of our theory of change, which really recognizes that, that our, uh, our purpose being the mission statement, but the ultimate impact that we are looking for and that we're advancing through our work is a living economy that embodies caring, cooperation, regeneration, and deep democracy. The, the uplifting earth rights and human rights for all. So that is kind of our larger me our, our macro analysis under which the strategic objectives and what we do day to day sits. And so as we think about um, um, when we think as we think about uh, disaster injustice, we see it through this larger lens of environmental justice and climate justice in the ways that there the folks who are on the front lines of impact are often left out of the discussions around the solutions. And this is what keeps us in this continuous spiral of disproportionate impact. And so just reminding us of what all the kind of disasters are that are out there. Um, and we'll be talking a little bit more about storms I mean, just because that is what we tend to work on the most, but um, you know, storms, flooding and so forth. But there are all these other disasters that are also either driven by climate change or exacerbated by climate change, and that we also touch on as well. So when we when we recognize that our our communities are more likely to be meaning meaning um, BIPOC communities, Black, Indigenous, people of color communities, and we 
work primarily with African American communities, but not exclusively. But we, but stemming from um, slavery uh, in, in times until now, back then, when um, right before emancipation in 1861 and 62, there were two acts that were passed called the Morrill and Homestead Acts, and those provided grants to to white Americans. To, for building colleges and also there were land grants for farming and so forth. And all of those, those grants were put in place that really gave folks kind of a leg up. But that was right before emancipation. And so African-Americans did not, you know, not only were we, were we emancipated without, without land after having been taken away from our own generational wealth, in the motherland, but we then were um, enslaved for all of those years and then just kind of emancipated, quote unquote, but without the means to really care for ourselves and, um, and build, build, um, build wealth. And so then there were policies put in place that put us even further behind. And so as a result, we, and then on top of it all, we didn't have access to the legal services that as we even acquired land, we weren't able to, um, to legally pass it down to our um, descendants because of, uh, of the, the extreme um, um, disparities in kind of status in society we did after emancipation. So all of this is important because it means that now um, where we live, whether we own homes, all of this is impacted by that history that still has vestiges today. And since then we've had redlining and so forth that has further um, impacted and, 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 and put us into certain places where we can live. Um, and so as a result, we are less, less, more likely to have poor housing stock, more likely to, that's more vulnerable to disasters, more likely to live in flood plains, so definitely more likely to be flooded out of our homes. Um, and then uh, without home ownership, a, a lot of the things that enable us to recover from disasters are also um, also been challenged because we don't have the, we don't have the, 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 the resources, the economic resources to be able to, to recover easily. So in, ter in, in, so in the first place being dis disproportionately impacted because of poor housing stock and so forth. And then on top of it all, not only are we more likely to live in floodplains, but also more likely to live next to toxic facilities. Um, 71% of African Americans live in counties in violation of federal air pollution standards, and an African American family making $50,000 a year is more likely to live next to a toxic facility than a white American family making $15,000 a year. According to the work of greats like Dr. Robert Bullard and Dr. Manuel Pastor. And so that means that not only are we experiencing these disasters, but we're also living next to things that can become like ticking time bombs um, when if, if impacted by disasters. We saw what happened with, with Fukushima Daiichi in um, Japan with the tsunami. And so this, I show this image because it is a nuclear reactor in a very low income African American community in Mississippi. The area has the, the residents of the community have very low mobility and um, there's only one road in and out. And when they, when they were bringing that nuclear reactor online, they very much protested because they were concerned about what would happen if there was an incident. But really the municipality pushed to have it because they were, they were enthusiastic about the tax revenues that would come to the the county, if you know, with it being cited there. So, as a result, we when when the flooding happened in 2011, there was a great concern that that nuclear reactor would be impacted and the community would be in trouble. Um, and with without the mobility and with only one road in and out, the likelihood of being able to escape, even if they had enough warning to get away it was uh, very much compromised. When we went there to visit, um, because we had heard about all the flooding and we have an NAACP branch there, we visited first this area, this place where they, it was a church, they had set up all of these cots and um, because a lot of people had been displaced from their homes, like the people from this home. And they, and we asked them, and so they told us that they weren't able to get resources from the Red Cross for the shelter. And then we found the Red Cross workers and they were in front of City Hall and they just had like a 
table and two chairs. They were kind of just sitting there, the two of them. Unlike the other places I visited where there were full-fledged disaster recovery centers, they were just there with the table, and, you know, card table and two chairs kind of thing. And so we asked why it is that, the, that this community was being underinvested in, in terms of the disaster response. And they said, well, um, because the Red Cross has a rule where they can't set up kind of full services within seven miles of a nuclear reactor, which was reasonable um, because, you know, it is in the post-disaster context, it is, or during a disaster, it's very dangerous to be near a nuclear reactor. But the point should be that if that's the case, then people shouldn't be living that close to a nuclear reactor. If it's, if it's such a, a place of danger that Red Cross would actually have a rule about it, then that, that rule should follow um, the siting and the zoning laws uh, around these kind of um, toxic facilities. And this is where the problem lies, that, that, um, that, that our policies fail to, to fully protect uh, people. And so we all know after Hurricane Katrina, the people who died were unable to evacuate um, people with special health needs, people who were elderly. And because uh, so many of the low-income African-Americans there did not have personal transportation, they have people who perished as a result and people who had to be evacuated in these kind of extreme um, rescue efforts like the one pictured here. Um, and then in the, with the prisons there, the, in the aftermath um, of Katrina, deputies literally abandoned people and left them um, standing in sewage painted waters up, you know, and they were left for days without food, without water, um, with very little ventilation. They had to dig through the walls to try to get ventilation. Um, and that's, again, when we talk about, you know, going back to the holes of ships where people were put in places where, that weren't meant for humanity. Similarly, uh, people abandon as if they aren't people, as if they don't matter. And this is where we have the cry for Black Lives Matter, because in, in every stage, it has been as if our lives don't matter, that they're inconsequential, that they're negligible, that they're disposable. And so, not only do we have, uh, so we have various folks um, who are, you know, so African American more vulnerable, but then within that, African American women also more vulnerable, and women in general, because in the, in the aftermath of, of uh, Katrina, we saw many stories of sexual assault, and that's, a, that's what happens in the aftermath of disasters in general, whether it's the earthquake in Gujarat, the earthquake in Haiti, the tsunami, the BP oil drilling disaster consistently in each of these disasters, violence against women picks up both sexual assault, um, due to insecurity, as well as domestic violence with a spike in, um, in stress and, and stressors in the home. And so, you know, whether it's the, whether it's the disasters or, or the flooding, the, you know, whether it's the hurricanes or the flooding or the, even the increase in, in snow, we are seeing these disasters that are um, that are causing that are that really are causing harm to systems that will that were already compromised that weren't that where the systems are are either either oppressing or not actually um, caring for communities for people in our communities that are, are are marginalized. When we talk about uh, the COVID nineteen, I was on a panel with a gentleman named um, Steve Benjamin, who's a mayor of of uh, Columbia, South Carolina, and he said uh, he said uh, the COVID nineteen, which is really, which is really it's a, a disaster in and of itself, is that COVID nineteen was uh, he called it he said it's like a, an X ray that exposed the broken bones of the American society, and I thought that said it very well because it did very much expose what. We on the front lines already know because that's our daily reality. On March 13th, before the before the COVID-19 was kind of beyond them talking about this this um, this nursing home in in Kirkland, Washington, I was um, I was away on a short vacation and just kind of watching on the news, hearing how they were talking about, it, hearing what they were predicting in terms of what was to come in, in terms of its spread and seeing how the lawmakers were talking about it. And I sat there and spent 19 hours 
and wrote The 10 Equity Implications of COVID-19. And that again was March, March 13th before it really became a thing. And, um, and it really ended up be, being, you know, people, people termed it as prophetic, but it wasn't. Anybody who's on the front lines could see what was coming. Um, so it, 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 it included everything from differential, you know, certainly the differential spread of the disease and, um, and that came to bear. It included, went into the, the number one was about the hate crimes that would happen and the, and the kind of anti, um, anti-Asian and other um, um, sentiments and on and on. And all of that came to pass in spades and even more. And so, the, but it's because these are the, these are the broken bones that some of us are all too familiar with that are just kind of exploited by any of these shocks to a society that is broken at its core. And so, um, so sea level rise is another impact that we see that then becomes exacerbated by uh, that where storms are, are exacerbated by sea level rise, where storm surge is what caused so much harm with Superstorm um, Sandy and also with Katrina as well and the, some of the disasters that have come afterwards. Um, and where to the extent where uh, no official said that today's flood would be equal to tomorrow's high tide, like this, the high tide, which is normal. Flooding is becoming just as normal. We are seeing places where 100 year floods are happening every couple of years, where 50 year floods are happening, you know, much more often, and so on and so on. And so even with the, the impacts of the disasters, even the responses, you know, who, who gets what and when differs extremely, whether it's the response, um, the, the, the lack of response and caretaking for, for prisoners, or it's the ways that prisoners are actually used in the response. We know for fires that, um, that prisoners are used. And one of the kind of chilling things that I heard was that um, because so many of the prisoners were getting COVID-19, in the context of the fires that were happening last year, they were basically saying, because prisoners are getting COVID-19, those resources aren't available in the, in to fight the, the California fires. And that kind of um, lack of concern for the fact that the prisoners were getting COVID-19, that it was only kind of stated in the context of those resources not being available to fight those fires really just said it all. Um, and it really kind of gives rise to this notion of, we talk about essential workers, essential work, but really the, the workers are seen as disposable, whether it's, the, again, the folks in the middle passage being brought over from, from um, Sub-Saharan Africa and the, as cargo in the hulls of ships where if they died in the middle passage, their bodies were just tossed over or whether it's the, the women who were uh, toiling in the field picking cotton and when they were given birth, they had to just give birth in the field, strap their babies to their back and keep picking cotton. They didn't even get the day off. Or whether it is all the ways that, that, that folks are considered to be disposable. And so where, whereas, whereas the prisoners are abandoned in, their, in the prisons when the disasters come, later when they're cleaning up or when they need to fight the fire, then the prisoners are, are all of a sudden being brought into play, but not at all considered um, worthy of, of care and of, um, of their lives being um, preserved. And so we see how, again, like I said in that earlier slide, how systemically all of this, um, all of this comes into play. We have the ALEC, which is the American Legislative Exchange Council, um, pushing on privatized privatization of, of prisoners of you know, prisons and um, pushing for for policies that support prison labor. We were working with one of these large solar companies and came to find out that they were contracting with the organization or the company that was using prison labor for the manufacture of their solar panels. And so when we came to them about that with concern, they said, oh, well, it's actually putting these, these prisoners on a path to employment. So this is actually kind of on the job training, which, you know, could sound reasonable, except for then we find out that that same big solar company had a policy prohibiting hiring prisoners. Um, and it was, again, the biggest solar company out there. 
And so when they give this rationale, but yet they wouldn't even employ the prisoners when they came out, we see that really it's um, all lip service and really they're just using prisoners to, to create, to, to generate these solar panels in the cheapest way possible. For our whole economy, whether it's creating positive things like solar panels or cleaning up from the fossil fuel, you know, the ravages of the fossil fuel industry by having to fight fires, again, it's people being disposable um, while their work is so essential for, for, our, for our lives and our economy. And so when we talk about the, uh, the aftermath of disasters, I took this picture, I was in Alabama, and it just struck me that every last person in line to get food in this place, um, I think this was in Tuscaloosa, or no, I think it was well, Tuscaloosa, I think, um, where every last person in line to get food was African American, and every last person on the other side handing out the food was white American, and that uh, stood out both in terms of like who was who wasn't impacted at all by the disaster, who was maybe impacted but was able to bounce back, who was in need versus who was able to to provide, and that the fact that it was just so starkly cut down racial lines just really stood out to me. Similarly, at that same place, that building was where people were inside. And then outside, they were holding a town hall meeting. And on the stage were people from the local government, from FEMA, from um, the Red Cross, who had the information, who had the resources that they were, they were sharing. And down to a person, every last person up there was white. And then at that same moment, lined up at the mic, the people who needed services, who needed information, who needed resources, at that moment, every last person lined up at the mic was an African-American woman, uh, whereas the people on the stage were predominantly white men. And so these are the kind of gender and race dynamics that we find and certainly the race dynamics in the context of these disasters. What also struck me too is that the women, the African-American women were lined up at the mic to get information and resources, while it was largely the men and boys <laughs> that were out there that were in line getting the food. So that that struck me kind of later on when I started giving the presentation. So um, that's a whole other presentation. Um, so also as we talk about the response and the inequities in response, seven years after Hurricane Katrina, I was back in Louisiana because Hurricane Isaac had come through. And um, I was watching CNN because I was in Plaquemines Parish and uh, where the levees had been completely breached and the people had lost land and property and, and livestock and so forth. Um, and without loss of life, thank, thank heaven, but uh, with its considerably, considerable loss of property in the land and definitely injuries took place. And so they were asking the Senator at the time, Senator Mary Landrieu, why it was that the levees were not reinforced. It had been seven years since Katrina and there was a whole initiative that to reinforce the levees afterwards. And she said she asked the Army Corps of Engineers the same question and that they replied that they used a formula to decide which levees will be reinforced as a priority. And the formula applied points, more, more points to, to according to what the economic impact would be if the levee was overtaken. So literally it's it's kind of protecting property values instead of people so it doesn't matter how many people were there the vulnerability of the people it only mattered what the economic impact would be as a levy was overtaken and so on one hand if you're just kind of crunching numbers you know there's some at least um method to the madness in terms of a cost benefit analysis but uh, but we always need to be thinking about cost and whom, cost of what and whom, and who is benefiting. And this is where we see um, Dr. Robert Bullard's um, phrase, the, the wrong complexion for protection play out in this context. So um, similarly, as, uh, this was a, in the Associated Press, this is a these were two separate articles, but both in the Associated Press and on the same day after Hurricane Katrina. And so when it's pictured, these two white folks um, pictured, it says, two residents wade through chest deep floodwaters after finding bread and soda from a local grocery store after Hurricane Katrina came through. But when it's uh, uh, 
an African American um, young man. It says a young man walks through Tusky flood waters after looting a grocery store in New Orleans. They're doing the exact same act on the exact same day, and the story is told by the exact same news outlet. But when it's white people, they are just surviving, doing what they need to do to survive by finding bread and soda that happens to be on these grocery store counters that are abandoned. And when, but when it's an African American male, he is looting the grocery store. And so it's that kind of narrative that leads to the disproportionate criminalization of African Americans. And that narrative is consistent. Um, and so we know we, 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 it's, given, it's given rise to the memes this last year around living while black. So whether you're in Starbucks and black and you end up having the police called on you, whether you fall asleep in your dorm room in our black, in, in your dorm common area and are black and have the police called on you, or you're in, you're leaving an Airbnb that you lawfully rented and you're black and you have and you're taking your own items out because you just completed your rental um, and you're black and you get the police called on you for uh, people assuming you've um, looted the police. And so these are the, these are the things that, that this kind of racism and the racist uh, narrative can lead to criminalization. And this is what led to what happened when folks who were just, just like everybody else trying to get back into town to, to um, get food, to find relatives, and the police were, were called on them on the Danziger Bridge after Katrina, and the police ended up killing um, unarmed Black civilians on the bridge, and then they, they, they tried to cover it up as well. And so for us, racial part profiling, you know, and then criminalization, even whether it's official criminalization where you're actually prosecuted, or criminalization, as we saw with um, Trayvon Martin, where someone has criminalized you in their minds, and then um, and, and it becomes a death sentence for our communities. So, on a, on another uh, sadder note, around the racial profiling as well, uh, but not racial profiling around racism, um, we we there was a family we visited in this in this small town um geiger alabama where and it was after the flooding and and, and tornadoes of 2011 and um we met with this family where they had there was only we met with this young man and he was talking about a young boy really it was in his early teens and he was talking about how he was with his mother his cousin and like a neighbor's child and the tornadoes started coming. They knew the tornado was coming, the sirens were going off and so forth. And they went next door to the church and this was an African-American family. Um, they went to the church next door, which is a, 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 a church of the population of the church is white American. And so they went and they said they had seen other people going in there with their belongings and they knew that the church was offering shelter to people. And so they went over there and they were like, yeah, the storm's coming. We wanted to see if you can, if we can be sheltered here. And they said they weren't offering shelter. And so then the storm came and um, their home was kind of, uh, was like a trailer home and it was destroyed. And the young man we spoke, in, spoke to was the only survivor from that situation. And so again, people are paying the price of racism with their lives on multiple fronts. And so then this is why, again, we see that in dealing with the, with, it's one thing in terms of work we could do along the disaster continuum in terms of disaster preparedness and disaster response and recovery and redevelopment, but then there is this larger frame of our society that needs to be fixed for us to really um, deal with the disproportionate impact of disasters um, in our communities. So we know it's not just the US, it's also overseas. The US is 4% uh, of the global population, but 25% of the emissions that drive climate change. And so these disasters that are happening in different places are really, um, are really man-made and, and, and you know to a large extent 
Um, we have also, uh, so we have this kind of situation around climate driven migration in Central America and South America and other places that come up through those board, the, through the south, southern borders. Many of the folks are coming through because of the shifts in agricultural yields that make their lands not, you know, you know not being produced, producing anything anymore. And they're, you know, they live off of agriculture and others are coming through because their lands have become uninhabitable because of disasters or other types of you know, extreme weather. And so when we have folks coming in because of that, yeah, A, we, uh, at the very least, we can consider ourselves responsible and accountable to the needs that are, that are created by what we've done. But B, even if not that, because we are a land of plenty, but instead we have this kind of false scarcity scarcity mentality, which again, led us to determine that we needed to oppress others in order to be well with the founding of this nation and it continues on in practices like these punitive immigration policies that were being particularly happening in the former administration, which is what led to what we find in terms of, instead of kind of offering safe harbor and refuge and sanctuary, instead we're putting kids and families in, in cages. This is a quote from a Kenyan-born Somali poet, Warsan Shirway, Shirway, where she said, you have to understand that no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. So even as we, as we acknowledge that, that these things are happening, that we need to address climate change, that we need to, to, to have our, get our cities ready for disasters and so forth, the solutions are, um, are variable in terms of uh, what we're doing. So whether it's climate, uh, whether it's climate action plans or urban renewal plans or opportunity zones and so forth, the extent to which they are actually serving those communities is quite variable. And we see instead often, too often gentrification and displacement of the communities that they purport to serve. Um, and even as we try to address the, the, the first folks who have had to, um, who have had to, to leave their lands, the Biloxi Chittimaca Choctaw um, group in Southern Louisiana, their lands were being overtaken by climate change. And at the same time, their lands were sinking because of drilling and other things that are causing their, their land to, to, to sink. And so now they're having to, um, to find an entire new place to live. And we have, we have moved many of the, in the process of moving. We're working with this community called Sam Branch, Texas, that does not have um, has not have had running water. It's a it's a uh, freedman settlement, so it was a former it was a place where freed um, emancipated enslaved persons were um, were able to to set up land. And um, back in 1865, but the community is um, the community hasn't had running water since then, and since the 1980s, even their well water was contaminated. And so, but what's happening there is that, again, the FEMA floodplains has declared, just recently declared that area to be a floodplain. They have never had a flood in the 200 plus year existence since 1865, but yet now they're a floodplain, which means that the city isn't offering, it's a, it's a an unincorporated area, but it's kind of annexed by Dallas County but it has given Dallas County the license not to provide any services there. The, folk, the folks can't, can't get assistance to do upgrades to their homes, all because it's been declared a floodplain. And then on top of it all, so now it's eligible for the FEMA buyout program, but the FEMA buyout has resulted in people who, who, who stepped forward and said, yes, I'd like to do the buyout, uh, after they've really been in some ways forced out of their land because of become uninhabitable with no services. They don't have bath, they don't have um, trash pickup, you know, then the water situation, all of the things that for which we're supposed to be paying taxes are, aren't things that, that are afforded to them. And so so some people said, all right, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll accept the buyout. But what they did was they assessed the land, then they subtracted the amount that it would take for them to demolish the homes. And they gave them what was left, which was a check for $200 for each of them. And this is for land that's been in their home, in their families for generations since the, the area was founded by, by emancipated persons. And so this is, 
uh, be kind of egregious black land theft from the small pieces of land that we're able to get that's happening. And then on top of it all, so yes, they're assessed and then that amount is subtracted and then they get checked for $200. But then we go back and we look at those same properties and the property values have quadrupled plus since that has happened. So then we start to wonder what is the bigger, who, who has interest in that land and is that driving the fact that it was declared a flood plan, is that driving the pressure for them to, to, to be moved? So all of these things are part of this larger system that we need to be looking at. So uh, that was a lot of talking. So I'm just going to take us to another little um, little uh, video. Let's see here. Okay. And this is a, a, a uh, performance by a group called Climbing Poetry and um, really making a statement around uh, making a statement around um, around disasters and disaster capitalism. So hold on. Okay. They are selling the rain. They are leasing the rivers. They are auctioning off the ocean to the highest bidders. As giant chunks of the polar ice cap this large to the North Pole. And tourists flock to the site to take pictures. There is disaster tourism. Like this disaster profiteering. Off the torrential storm. And the war and the wrath of global warming. Who will get paid to rebuild? And who will they build for? Who will endure the drought and the rain? Who will be safe and sound indoors? Who built the missiles? The smart bombs? The rockets? Who gets raided? Who gets paid from whose pockets? Who gets sent off to war? Who dies? For whose profits? Who gets remembered? Who's been forgotten? Congressman Richard Baker said, we finally cleaned the public housing in New Orleans. We couldn't do it, but God did. Rid the city of the poor. We build the city for the rich with contractors from everywhere but New Orleans coming in. Folks in the projects were forced to evacuate even where Katrina didn't hit. Then armed guards blocked the doorways, wouldn't let the residents back in. Demolition scheduled while people live in tents under I-10. And thousands driven out the south are still scattered across the states as New Orleans is looted by profiteers who want to make over his face. Flood the lower night to save the wealthier estates as Mississippi renovates with slot machines and condos. So you gotta win the lotto if you plan to keep your place. It's the, the same. same. From gulf to gulf, the chip stackers turn disaster into profit, reaping billions off the damage that they started in New Orleans. For the Prince I Iraq, paychecks from tax dollars for no big contract. So Halliburton can rebuild the pillage that they plotted. Like Blackwater, the same military firm that massacred 17 Iraqis in a bloodbath, then in Katrina's aftermath, got paid to raid the streets with fresh memories of Baghdad. Meanwhile, around the globe, the IMF adds another nail to all the coffins. The World Bank acts like a saint while making bank off grave robbing, imposing interest on poor countries they know could never pay them back. Prefer dealing with dictators across the global map so the debt of generations falls on workers' children's backs who are displaced when land is lost for dams and hands are bound to sweatshop retail racks and rooms that lead to nowhere except back to those who own the pockets of international contracts. I think you get the idea. I highly recommend checking that out. Um, so, yes, I see a little note here. Okay, um, sorry about that. So, um, Okay. Anyway, so so when we uh, when we uh, when we listen to those words, it gives a sense of the the challenges that we that we that we that we face with um, 
I'm not, uh, so I'm not sure um, what, what that chat meant. So anyway, hopefully you can see um, see what's going on here. Um, let me just make sure. I'm and let's see. Um, so as we, so I'm kind of wrapping up here, but the systems feel in the inequities as they talk about like the, the, the ways that whether it's disaster capitalism or capitalism in general, that fuels the system that has gotten us to where we are today. Um, and the way that the, the, the very kind of stomping on our democracy is where we have, um, is where we've, um, where we've come and how these types of uh, injustices and inequities uh, persist. It's another video, video I would have shown you, but I feel like we're running a little bit short on time. So definitely welcome, recommend you check out 350.org's climate name change video if you ever get a chance. So as we kind of talk about kind of those roots of oppression, so I spent a lot of time on that because I want to make sure that we are clear that it that the oppressive systems are in, with, and under every last aspect of our economic, political systems and our systems around the commons and so forth. As such, we, we can't just tweak a system. We can't just reform a system that is literally predicated on there being winners and losers. And so when we talk about a just transition, we're talking about um, shifting from society that is rooted in an extractive economy, one around of exploitation, uh, capitalism, uh, militarism, and um, consumerism, and really about the enclosure of wealth and power. We have to really um, dismantle that system and move us towards a living economy that's rooted in principles of caring and caring and sacredness, um, ecological and social well-being, regeneration, cooperation, and deep democracy. So as we talk about um, uh, emergency management, we are you know, centering it in principles of equity, justice, inclusion, transparency, civil rights, human rights, earth rights, community centering community leadership, and so doing community knowledge, community leadership, um, community um, decision making. And so these are some of the practical things that we do in that, and we can share all of that with you. But again, it's all around putting communities in the driver's seat, and it's all around shifting power, shifting wealth, and, and, and establishing true democracy. So again, these are all just kind of practical you know, policy solutions and so forth that we put forward that you'll definitely have access to as we provide the links to these things. But I want to kind of get us to being able to talk. But um, just wrapping with this notion of people-powered solutions, making sure that whether it's women, as we talk about the disproportionate impact of some identified persons, given the disproportionate impact that we find, um, or you know, ensuring that we are overturning and risk that we overturning Citizen United and restoring power to the people and to the true democracy. I just want to close with one other small um, piece of spoken word again spoken from the people who are who are on the front lines and um, in their own voice. Dear Mata you are a seven month old sunrise of gummy smiles. You are bald as an egg and bald as the Buddha. Your sighs that are thunder, shrieks that are lightning, so excited for bananas, hugs, and our morning walks along the lagoon. Dear Mata Filipino, I want to tell you about that lagoon, that lucid, sleepy lagoon lounging against the sunrise. Men say that one day, that lagoon will devour you. They say it will gnaw at the shoreline, chew at the roots of your breadfruit trees, gulp down rows of your seawalls, and crunch through your island-shattered bones. They say you, your daughter, and your granddaughter, too, will wander ruthless with only a passport to call home. Dear Mata Filipino, don't cry. Mommy promises you, no one 
will come and devour you. No greedy whale of a company sharking through political seas, no backwater bullying of businesses with broken morals, no blindfolded bureaucracies gonna push this mother ocean over the edge. No one's drowning, baby. No one's moving. No one's losing their homeland. No one's gonna become a climate change refugee. Or should I say, no one else. To the Carteret Islanders of Papua New Guinea, and to the Taro Islanders of Fiji, I take this moment to apologize to you. We are drawing the line here. Because, baby, we are going to fight. Your mommy, daddy, boo boo, Jimma, your country, and your president, too, we will all fight. And even though there are those hidden behind platinum titles who like to pretend that we don't exist, that the Marshall Islands, Tuvalu, Kiribati, Maldives, and Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines and floods of Pakistan, Algeria, and Colombia, and hurricanes, tidal waves, and earthquakes didn't exist, still, there are those who see us. Hands reaching out, fists raising up, banners unfurling, megaphones booming, and we are canoes blocking coal ships. We are the radiance of solar villages. We are the rich, clean soil of the farmer's past. We are petitions blooming from teenage fingertips. We are families biking, recycling, reusing, engineers dreaming, designing, building, artists painting, dancing, writing. We are spreading the word. And there are thousands out on the street. Marching with signs, hand in hand, chanting for change now. They're marching for you, baby. They're marching for us. Because we deserve to do more than just survive. We deserve to thrive. Dear Mata Filipino, you are eyes heavy with drowsy weight. So just close those eyes, baby, and sleep in peace. Because we won't let you down. You'll see. Thank you. So happy to open left the Q and A now. Though I'll hand it back to Jacob, I guess. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That was uh, wonderful, um, sobering. If if we were all in person, we could uh, thank you with with a round of applause. So it'll kind of have to imagine. But I want to uh, invite folks uh, to ask to ask questions. Uh, what did that What did that provoke to you? If you will raise your hand. We will ask you to unmute your mic and you can ask a question uh, yourself. Uh, in the meantime, we have a question uh, from Christopher Gabriel in the chat, which I will read out uh, while people um, uh, find, their, find their voice for, for speaking in person. Thank you for today's lecture. How does one digest urbanization within Asian countries, specifically with the, within the API DA populations globally in relation to tourism, and advertising slash propaganda. Chris, can I get you to un, uh, unmute and um, maybe maybe explain a little bit more what your what your question is um, about about sort of digesting what you what you uh, say a little bit more about that, and then we'll get an answer. Chris, you're unmuted. Sorry, um, I'm uh, Christopher Gabriel's partner, Rick no. Chan. Sorry, I, I apologize, um, uh, Jacqueline. Thank you so much for the lecture. Um, I, I want to say personally, like I'm, it, it's really relieving to. Um, but thank you. Um, I was thinking in um, relation to my family in the Philippines. Um, who, who's very dedicated um, to uh, medicine. Um, I, I, have, I have no words for it, um, but here's Christopher. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Jacqueline. Um, yeah, that was, that was a wonderful uh, presentation. Um, yeah, I think uh, Rick's question here, um, how do we digest all of this? I think that was uh, a lot, you know, and a lot to think about. I'm always of the mindset or always looking for what's the solution, right? Uh, we've identified the problem and um, 
I think we can be unanimously in agreement that there is one. So what, what do solutions look like uh, to you? Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So, so as I, I mean, not as I said, it, yeah, but, um, but I'll elaborate on what I said, I'll say, is that, um, is that we really, like that, I was saying that we have kind of the, the things that we can do about each stage of the emergency management continuum, you know, from preparedness to response to recovery to redevelopment. And then I was saying that these problems, the fact that we are having more disasters, the fact that there are these communities that are disproportionately impacted, that the solutions that all, all of those approaches that are kind of based on the stages of the disaster continuum are, are incremental at best. And that, that, that true solutions need to eliminate the inequities themselves. And so that's what I was saying before that we need to, about the societal shifts that we need to make from a, I said at the beginning instead of the end, from a society that's rooted in extraction, exploitation, domination to a society that is um, rooted in, in cooperation, caring, um, sacredness, and so forth. And part of part of that starts with moving away from a scarcity of mentality because we're not gonna have the political will to do that until people recognize that um, that we that a that we're that our wellness is interdependent, not only is our wellness interdependent on each other but that this false notion that some people are like that this is just kind of the balance of nature that some people are going to be doing bad and some people are going to be doing well because there's not enough for everybody and that's just the rule you know the the, the state of, of play but it's it's not um so we have to recognize that that narrative is completely false and 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 really eliminate the myth of scarcity and really embrace the abundance of you know, the reality of abundance and so that means everything from recognizing that we can grow all of the food that we need to, to eat um, and that we need to, we need to focus on local food production and growing our food as opposed to genetically modifying food, genetically creating seeds that only have one cycle, that the, the world is, a, a, is already divinely, the earth systems are already divinely designed. And if we lean into those systems, we can have the solutions that we need. It means that we have to, to move away from burning in order to, to, to generate energy because again, it's that burning of fossil fuels that's contributing so much to the, fossil, to the um, greenhouse gas emissions that are driving climate change. So we can generate our energy. A, we need to conserve energy so much more and stop wasting 45% of the energy that we generate. And then we need to switch to systems that are that are regeneratives themselves, the ways that we, build, we, we design buildings, we can design them in such a way that we are not, um, that, that we're leaning into kind of biomimicry and earth's natural systems and not having to, to, uh, to generate so much energy to power our buildings. And then the, 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 the power that we do need, we can get it from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, not exactly a, a super political beast, <laughs> has proven that we have, uh, we have the potential to generate what we need from, from wind and solar. Um, our, so each and every one, of, we need to be examining each and every one of these systems and there's a set of uh, solid recommendations for these systems that will get us out of kind of where we are now in this kind of you know, free fall towards catastrophic climate change that we've already started to see. Um, so that, those are just, a, a, you know, but that would have literally been an entire lecture in and of itself. And it really, is, you know, I kind of, I talked about those things in broad terms, but, but in some ways, part of the problem is that people don't understand the depth of the problem. Like you kind of, you know, imply that like we all know the problem, but, but we don't <laughs> because otherwise, if we did, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing. So um, clearly people are kind of missing out on what the, the depth of the problem is and the systemic nature thereof. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, so uh, Andres, uh, do you want to uh, unmute yourself and ask a question? Yes. Um, once again, thank you so much, Jacqueline, for not only being here with us today, but also for 
all the knowledge and information you've been able to share with us. Um, I wanted to ask a question specifically towards that element of putting communities in the driver's seat. And with, I guess, this country's historic uh, systems of voter suppression and the like reinvigorated environment that we're seeing that now in legislation, such as what recently occurred in Georgia, how, I mean, going forward, what strategies or best next steps would you like to see being put forth to um, do that? Or do you view this community-centric approach to be um, almost separate from the legislative process and the representative process that we're currently seeing in government. Thank you. Yeah. So I do see them as, as, as very interconnected. Um, I mean, there is definitely a strong element of like what they call small D democracy and making sure the communities are the driver's seat, whether it's at the local level or otherwise. But also, we need to have communities in the driver's seat of our legislative process. Like, we need to have a real democracy, right? Now, we've seen games, the, the amount of mobilization that has been needed to get the games that we've had is because it is like pushing a 2,000 pound boulder up the hill, and that hill being the corporatocracy and, and, the, and, and the, the outsized influence that corporations have on our legislator, our legislators and therefore our legislative processes and our legislation. And so we definitely need to get money out of politics and, and kind of remove this notion of corporate personhood in order to have people at the driver's seat and you know from legislation down to kind of programming and so forth. So so I do see them as directly interconnected and, and with that we need to then make sure that we are getting folks in office that represent the, the interests of the community. And then we're holding, we're, we as communities are holding them accountable. Um, and so that they're really accountable to us as, account, as opposed to accountable to the money interests that are getting too many of them into office. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm kind of both in. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for the question. I think we have time for one, maybe two more questions. Uh, so we have one, Eugenia, do you want to uh, ask? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I also wanted to ask about putting communities in the driver's seat. And I, I was wondering whether um, the environmental and climate justice program um, does community-based archiving and collecting of stories so that we can um, not just sort of um, investigate these really important histories of, of land theft and devaluing black lives, but also um, so that there's a kind of memory of all of the earlier forms of organizing and resistance to these systems. Um, so I was wondering if that's part of recovery too. Yes, thank you so much for asking. Um, we do have what we're calling our kind of our story library. It would be a lot more I'll have more official sounding to call it archives, but uh, but uh, yes, yeah, so, but uh, but yes, yeah, so absolutely on the very same page as you on that, and so we we both kind of collect stories and keep them. We also then put them out, like we we have this thing called unleashing the power of the people, which is tells the stories of, as you said, the the the, the stories of movement and how how successes have happened in various. At various levels that are driven by community. We also um, are just now reviving our newsletter, which we had put out before, that also kind of tells snippets of these stories and like large feature stories and little snippets of what's happening in communities and including that in our archives. Um, so we have a number of different ways of both collecting the stories and then telling the stories and then making sure that we have this, this uh, you know, library that that's historical and that's preserved um, as well. So thank you for asking. That's great, thank you. Thank you. Well, I wanna uh, thank you ag again so much. I don't see any more hands uh, here, but we've also taken up a lot of your time. So I really wanna thank you very much uh, for joining us. Uh, this was really a, um, as I said before, a really sobering and provocative talk and I think a really uh, clarion call to, as you say, kind of not just think through the the small bore um, like emergency management continuum, 
but to but to think about how uh, the 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 uneven vulnerability that we see to hazards is is really shaped by broader societies, broader inequalities, um, as you say, broader histories dating back to the 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 dispossession and, ge and genocide and slavery on which the country was founded, uh, which makes for a tall order, but also um, a, a really crucial and necessary one. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you all for coming. And I hope to see you on April 16th for Rick Mizell's uh, talk and at future uh, Initiative for Critical Disaster Studies events. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Take care.